Okay, good morning. Thank you for to everyone for being here. I think we can get started. Uh, my name is Luca Belli. I'm senior researcher at the Center for Technology and Society at FGV in Rio de Janeiro, and I will be the moderator of this session. Uh, we have a, an amazing set of panelists uh, to discuss uh, online terrorism and the challenges that this uh, topic is bringing us with regard to privacy, security, free speech, uh, law enforcement, and a lot of other different facets that your uh, panelists will discuss and that will be explored with, pro I hope, with provoking thoughts to trigger some debate also with the audience. Uh, we will start with uh, some introduction, introducing remarks from the panelists, and then you will have time for uh, discussion. To, so if you want to uh, think about which questions, which comment you want to raise, please start doing so. I'm just introducing uh, our distinguished panelists now. It's, let's start with Eleanor Buxton, who is from the UK government, uh, Stephen Turner from Twitter, uh, Nils uh, Lestrad from the Dutch Internet Referral Unit and National Police Intelligence Unit on Cyber Jihad, very extensive title. Uh, Jamila, Jamila Ventuini from NICBR, which is the Brazilian Network for Information Center in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Estelle Massé from uh, Access Now. And last but not least, obviously, Marion uh, Fernandez Perez, who is senior policy. Uh, um, advisor at the European Digital Rights. Uh, let's start in order uh, with Eleanor Buxton with some remarks from the UK government. Um, great. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, although why they put the IDF in Switzerland instead of somewhere more exotic this year, I'm not sure. Um, but um, so terrorism and security, you know, how can we, the, in the session it was, how can we achieve proposals that achieve security and enable the population to keep their privacy and allow everyone to express themselves freely? So the first thing I would say is this is really challenging and anyone who follows, and apologies to those of you who, was in the, who were in the encryption session earlier because I will go over some of the same ground that I said this morning. Um, you know, this is a really, really challenging issue for us. The internet has exposed new vulnerabilities, it's introduced new challenges, but the priority for the state remains the same, which is keeping people safe. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, the threat is real. We've had a number of terrorist attacks this year. The internet has been involved in some of those, uh, although I think to differing, ex to differing extents. Um, and how we deal with those threats, anticipate them and are able to disrupt them is a really big priority. And I spend an awful lot of time in meetings with uh, the Home Office, with our intelligence agencies, with the police, where people are really clear that what they are trying to do is make sure that they are able to protect uh, British citizens and citizens around the world, because we also have, you know, interest in keeping everyone else safe as well. Um, I think it's worth stating from the outset that the UK is firmly committed to the right to privacy, the right to freedom of expression, uh, the freedom to access information. You know, in general, rights should be protected online as they are offline. Um, and that is absolutely critical for us. You know, any interference with those rights has to be consistent with the principles of legality, necessity, and proportionality. There are no questions asked about that. Um, and, you know, we are also acutely conscious of how our domestic policy on uh, terrorism or extremism may play internationally and that states may look to us uh, to sort of take their own approaches from. So, you know, we don't want to be giving credence to approaches to combat terrorism uh, online, uh, which other states may misuse uh, for political purposes or sort of f to control sort of as a sort of moral policing, I guess. Um, so... I guess I'll just talk about two, two ways that we're looking to address terrorism online. So one of those is um, our legislation. So we think that governments can protect both security and fundamental rights through well-designed legisl legislation produced in a transparent um, and heavily scrutinized way. Uh, so we have a, uh, the 2016 Investigatory Powers Act, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, um, which incorporates robust independent oversight with clear avenues for legal remedy. 
a lot of people hate the Investigatory Powers Act. Let's be very clear about that. Um, you know, I've read all the criticism I think you could read. Um, and fair enough, you know, a lot, of that, a lot of what is in that law is not to people's liking. But the process that it went through to get where it is today and to come into force was three independent reviews. Um, and I would highly recommend to those of you who have a sort of academic interest in this reading uh, A Question of Trust by David Anderson, uh, who's a highly respected barrister and was the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation in the UK. Um, it went uh, through three parliamentary committees, including the Science and Technology Committee. We had calls for evidence. Anyone could submit evidence on uh, the proposals in the bill. And it was then voted through two houses of parliament. And even the former director of Liberty in the UK, Shami Chakrabarti, did not vote against the legislation. So, you know, we are... and. And I think it's fair to say, you know, it has been challenged and in some cases we are amending it. So it's not necessarily that we've got it perfect um, and that's worth acknowledging, but it is open to challenge, uh, which is really important for us to make sure uh, that it is as robust as possible and that we can use it in a sort of constructive way. Um, and I would just say that it also contains an overarching privacy clause to make clear that uh, warrants or other authorizations should not be granted where information could be reasonably obtained by less intrusive means. Um, and that act covers essentially, you know, it's, a, it's our sort of overarching surveillance framework. Uh, it covers issues relating to encryption, which I've talked about in detail this morning. Um, and, um, but that is our sort of fundamental standard at the moment. We separately have an issue around terrorist use of the internet um, for uh, propagandizing, uh, for recruitment, uh, in some cases for radicalization. And this is a real political priority. And this is something that you, again, if you pay attention to British politics, you will see a lot about this. Um, because for our ministers, it is a real issue. Um, I would say there are clearly a lot of factors that go into committing an act of violence. Um, and radicalization online may be one of those. Um, not always, um, and, um, but I think we do substantial research around uh, how the internet or how propaganda online may play a part in recruitment and radicalization alongside other factors, including community interventions, etc. Um, but what we want to do, and I would say, you know, from my experience as well, I've worked in northern Iraq where I've spoken to people who've gone out uh, to actually fight against ISIS. And often it's people who are bored and lonely at home and the internet offers them a sort of community and a way to uh, essentially sort of shift thoughts in some way. Um, and that's not quite the same thing as terrorism online, but it, it does make you think about the sort of access which the internet now provides to people who need a cause and who want a cause to sign up to. Um, so we want companies to use their platforms responsibly. Um, I was challenged on responsibility earlier this morning. Um, again, it's do you want people to be, uh, do you want terrorists to be recruiting on Facebook? Probably not. And Facebook are well aware of that. Twitter are well aware of that. They've got extensive terms and conditions that cover these issues. Um, and we work with them uh, to make sure that um, we're reducing content to the greatest extent that we can where it is illegal. And that's the really important thing, is where it is illegal or where it violates their own terms and conditions. Uh, we are not creating terms and conditions for the companies. Um, and I think it's just worth saying, you know, very aware that the technical challenges are massive um, and there are real issues around context and uh, context dependence and, you know, and in some cases detection isn't quite there yet. But we want to, con we have a continued dialogue with the companies, particularly through the global, I'm going to forget the acronym, Internet Forum to Counterterrorism. There we go. The GIF CT, um, and we're really confident that that's going to be a helpful measure in the future. Um, so I'll just conclude because I think I'm rambling on. But you know, I think one thing I would one thing I would say is you know don't underestimate the challenges that people face uh, and the challenges that we face in being able to protect people. Um, it's not the case that we have access to everything that we want to be that we want to, and we can just and we're sort of trying to usurp rights. That's just simply not it. Uh, there's a lot of frustrations. There's a lot of difficulties uh, in government. Um, and if you are interested to see how um, intelligence works in practice and how uh, those surveillance powers may have been used, um, 
I'd really recommend looking at our Intelligence and Security Committee because they do a lot of uh, reviews after terrorist attacks to look at how information was collected and possibly used in the wrong way or right way and the extent to which human error also plays a significant factor. Um, but um, they're really, really interesting to read uh, in terms of the difficulties that we face with terrorism online nowadays. And I also just recommend as a final point of reading um, an article called uh, uh, The Unraveling Web, I think, uh, by Paul Kilworth, who's a serving GCHQ officer. Uh, he's really, really excellent. And he published an article in Demos in November uh, that outlined the challenges that we face as more and more information is coming online, but as we're still trying to do our jobs in a responsible uh, rights protecting way to make sure that we can combat terrorism in an effective manner. So um, those are my intro thoughts. Sorry for rambling. Excellent. And also, I mean, thanks for, also for, for uh, highlighting two, I think, fundamental elements for the discussion, which are that there is a real threat. It's something that, ha I mean, terrorist threat has to be considered, and also that terrorism is, well, a priority, as you said, for the government, but, but it is also a, a positive obligation of the government to provide security to uh, citizens that have a fundamental right to security and that will complain with government after terrorist attack because they have failed to do something. So I think that is, that are, those are elements that we have to consider. Obviously, the measures that have to be implemented has to be, have to be legal, necessary and proportionate. So I think I would ask to uh, Stephen Turner from Twitter to explain us what are the measures that you are uh, taking and uh, how this is compatible with what we have just heard from Eleanor. Great, thank you so much. I am Stephen Turner from Twitter. I head up uh, Twitter's public policy efforts in Belgium and in Brussels. Um, yeah, I'll give you a quick overview. It will be quite succinct on what Twitter is doing to counter violent extremism, terrorism, radicalization on our platform, um, as well as how we address the issue wider from, societal, from a societal approach. Uh, as many of you know, Twitter is a global platform. We receive, or we see over a billion tweets every 48 hours. Many of these are positive discussions, stories, uh, personalities, humor, but on, as we've just heard and as we'll see in this panel, there's a lot of challenges that we face. And some of the communities that we see on the positive side, there's also the threat on the, on the negative as well. Um, the increasing political and societal will to combat violent extremism, radicalization and terrorism has been pushing forward in, in the last couple of years, uh, both online and offline. And as a terrorism, it's very much a societal uh, issue. It therefore requires a societal approach. Um, tech has a serious role to play in this, and we understand that very well, as much as um, many of our sister companies, as do governments, as do educators, NGOs, law enforcement, and academia, to better understand the ecosystem that we're dealing with. So I want to run through four things that Twitter is doing and what we've taken place over the past year and what we're looking to advance in the coming years. First and what you've probably seen more in the press is how we're leveraging our own technology to address the issue. We're able to leverage some of our uh, internal spam fighting tools and repurpose those to surface for review um, and identify terrorist content and accounts based on behavioral uh, signals. VoxPoll research found that ISIS accounts have faced substantial and aggressive disruption due to the action and progress made by Twitter. The second, and I'll expand on these more in discussion, but just want to give you an overview and also some, some thoughts for discussion. Um, the second big, big area is the industry cooperation with our sister companies and as well as the wider online ecosystem. Um, this is both at the regional and global levels, so expanding on some of the work that took place at the European level and moving that um, to the global internet forum where we're collaborating more so with governments and as well as civil society across the world. Uh, we're fully conscious of the challenges facing smaller companies as we are in that awkward semi-smallish company compared to some of our, uh, some of our uh, partners. But we'll continue to provide guidance, uh, information and best practices, and as well as collaborate and provide comprehensive approaches to some of these solutions to try to better address uh, countering violent extremism online. Some of these initiatives include organizations such as ICT for Peace and Tech Versus Terrorism, who have provided some great tools for smaller companies and as well as great overview for, for how they should implement or some things to consider when they're trying to address uh, uh, terrorism or radicalization on their platform if they only have one person that's running the whole company. The third point is strengthening our engagement with civil society and NGOs around positive digital activism. And we're supporting initiatives both at the European level and as well globally. 
We recognize that this is a problem that requires a multi-pronged approach, and we're looking at why a certain audience is ripe for recruitment. So trying to think beyond the takedown or beyond the content basis and looking at behind the scenes, why are certain, why are certain communities, why are certain individuals uh, certainly susceptible to some of these areas? And trying to address some of these main concerns, whether it be education, digital literacy, and working beyond the, on, on the online space. So, as, and we're trying to consider how we focus on the audience as much as we focus on those distributing propaganda. So again, trying to find that double, uh, double edge uh, approach. So some of these initiatives have included uh, expanding our network with organizations working on countering violent extremism and as well as related issues. So including digital literacy, promoting positive digital footprints, empowering women online, and as well as breaking down uh, some of the digital divides in communities in order to build up more empathy and understanding online. The final point, and I think this has been, been stressed by a number of the companies in some previous panels, has been on transparency. For Twitter, we're a very public platform, and we have been very public in, internally in trying to, in trying to show the progress that we make and some of the measures that we're taking. We have been uh, very open on the challenges that we face, and as well as some of the, some of the uh, pitfalls and mistakes that we've made in the past. I think one of, the, one of the ways we do this is obviously through our biannual transparency report, and we're trying to provide more input on, on statistics, insights, and requests that we receive. We already include government terms of service requests, and uh, we're looking to s expand to see where that information, where the next step can be and how further information could be uh, useful for civil society groups and as well as uh, for organizations overall. So uh, I think overall our efforts will continue to evolve and as we try to address and, change and adapt to some of the changing cultural and uh, societal understanding of some of these issues. But look forward to your questions and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Stephen. And actually, it's very impressive to see that there is over one billion tweets every hour. So the, 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 the dimension of the task that you have if you want to implement any solution is really huge. And uh, I, I really like the fact that you're focused on transparency and also on government requests. And uh, what a better follow-up than asking uh, Niels Lestrad, what are the government requests and how you're operating in the Netherlands? Well, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, quickly try to explain you um, what we do uh, and, uh, and also uh, what challenges we face. Um, there is a presentation, but it's not on yet. Can, can we have the presentation by Niels? Yeah, it's, it's, it's coming. Yeah, that's it. Great. Well, yeah, you can go on further. Um, well, we have an internet referral unit, as uh, many other European countries have. Um, ours uh, only exists since September this year, so we're now operational for three months, a bit more. Uh, we have three main tasks. The first is uh, detection of, uh, of content. Um, I'll just go into the specific kind of content that we're looking at a bit later. Uh, we do also uh, content analysis, and the, uh, one of the other tasks is uh, the notice and take action, which is, of course, the uh, uh, much discussed uh, uh, task um, and it consists of the, the, it's a voluntary request done by us to internet service providers to, uh, to block or remove specific content. Um, I'd like to make two main uh, uh, points before we continue. The first is that we are not convinced that we can clean the internet. It, it's, of course, who seeks will always find. Um, but we do think that we can contribute to, uh, to, to, uh, to the prevention of mass distribution of specific content um, and that's um, that's what we what we try to do and this is of course an ongoing exploration um, we are still trying to find out how to do this and and, and how also to uh, to do this in the well under the rule of law um, i first like to go to the uh, kind of content that we use of course, there are personal posts, uh, but the, most of the content that we're looking at is professional um, uh, content produced by, you can go on further, uh, by media outlets that are affiliated to or, uh, uh, well, or, or recognized by uh, 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 terrorist groups like IS. Just, just a few examples. Um, uh, one further, please. Yeah. Um, 
these are the kind of stamps that they use, uh, well, to, to show that the, the, the distribution of the production uh, uh, comes from them, uh, like Arfur Khan and so on. Um, uh, this is, well, the kind of content that we're then looking at, it's, it's, it's very diverse. You see graphic novels, claims, infographics, uh, news updates, chants, statements. Um, and as you see also in this picture, uh, often uh, also stamped by, uh, by professional media outlets. Um, sometimes it's subtle, uh, the message. Sometimes it's very clear. Um, well, but we'll go a bit deeper into that later. Um, we used to look at public accounts before 2015 mostly. Then people realized that uh, governments were also following what was happening online and it was also used in court. Uh, so that's where the messages became, at least on public sites, more moderate and um, more on, uh, on private and encrypted channels. Uh, and it's also where a more resilient infrastructure uh, came into being. Um, uh, they started to use apps, uh, add-ons, uh, uh, to, well, just to, to, to create a network uh, uh, for, for the distribution of uh, mm -hmm. propaganda. I can go too far there. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most important things is, of course, the criteria. What do we refer? Um, four main categories. First, there's, of course, the law. Uh, you have copyright, uh, criminal law. And then there's public order. At least in the Netherlands, there's something like community law that uh, well, uh, says that challenging behavior or unnecessary exposure to others is uh, prohibited. Uh, this is why, for example, you can quite easily just uh, prohibit a, a public screening on a square of a beheading or so. Uh, but there are blurred lines between behavior and on online expression. We don't have a similar democratically defined set of rules when it comes to, well, this uh, community law. And then, of course, there's the undesirable content, which the European Court of Human Rights uh, well, has declared that it falls, of course, under the, under the freedom of expression, so the shocking, offending, or disturbing content, uh, that's also a category. And then you have the contact, the contact breach, uh, and that's where you have the terms of service. If you go one farther, please. Then you will see that, uh, one back, um, that these are overlapping categories. There's just not one. Some, some of the content that you, that you find will just fit in more categories. And then if you go on further, yeah, this is uh, where we focus on. We only look at content that is against our law. And even within our law, we make the distinction between the severe crimes and, um, and, the, well, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the less severe crimes. It means that uh, we only refer content of which we are convinced, we as police, we are not judges of course, we are convinced that it is, uh, 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 that it's, that it's incitement to terrorism, incitement to, uh, to, to violence or recruitment to terrorism. Um, and it's blind to the theme. Now we are focusing on terrorist propaganda, but it can also be left or right wing uh, extremist propaganda. Um, so we don't report insults, we don't report discrimination, uh, we don't report content that only shocks, offends, or disturbs. One other important thing is that context is key, of course. Um, if you look at a distribution like Flames of War, one of the latest uh, uh, productions of uh, Al Hayat, one of the, I th I'm not sure, I think it was Al Hayat, um, we can find it on scientific blogs, uh, on, on news sites, but you can also find it on private blogs. And it's quite difficult sometimes to make the distinction. But we really try to focus only on, uh, we, we try to look at the context of the, of, the, of the sites and the forums where it is posted. Uh, there can be a neutralizing context and then we will not, not re uh, remove it. Uh, yes, you can go on farther. Um, I think the general picture, the broader context, you see a lot of differences now. There are uh, more European internet referral units. Uh, we are just one of them. And what you see at this point is that there is just a, uh, well, this is, it's not a complete picture. This is all, only what I found on open source. You see that there are differences um, in legal basis. Uh, we, for example, we work uh, on the general, uh, uh, you know, how do you say, it's just the, the general police task, which is in our police law. That's the basis of what we do. Other units like Europol or France have a more explicit uh, 
legal basis for their uh, internet referral work. Also, the criteria differ, uh, as you see. Uh, the transparency and the accountability, there are differences in that. Some units uh, produce uh, yearly reports, others don't. Uh, we will do this, but it only exists three months. And of course, also the court review. Uh, France has a, uh, has a review, an independent review. We don't. Um, and this is something that we also ask questions about ourselves. How can we just organize this. Um, it's not up to the police, of course, to, to, do, the, to do it ourselves, but at least we can, um, uh, we can ask questions about who, who reviews our work. Um, yeah, this brings me to the last slide. Um, it's um, about responsibility. Um, there are mass volumes of data online. We, as law enforcement, we cannot be free riders. We 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 do need to act. We do need to uh, well to to to, uh, to do something about what we see. But the question is, how do we do this in this new world, in this new digital area, uh, with such huge uh, volumes of, of content? Uh, criteria, of course, we talked about that. Um, this also re relates to who refers, uh, who makes the decision, and who is responsible. Uh, and the judicial review system, of course, which also is something that we talked about already. So this is it for now. Um, quick overview of our work. Excellent. Thank you very much also for stressing the importance of judicial review and the accountability of uh, law enforcement uh, actions. Now, uh, I think that was another very good leg for our next panelists that will explore the human rights dimension of uh, security and terrorism. So let's start with uh, Jamila Ventraini from Nick PR. Thank you, Luca. <clears throat> good morning, all. It's a pleasure to be here. First, I'd like to thank Marian and Estelle for the invitation. I'm part of the Brazilian Network Information Center team, but today I'm speaking on my personal capacity as an independent researcher, and I'll give a little bit of the context of what's happening in Brazil and some concerns, uh, human rights concerns, of, as Luca was saying. Uh, the first thing I'd like to mention is that terrorism is not a major concern for Brazilians. I don't remember any recent attacks associated with terrorists in the country. The most serious episode uh, happened in May 2006 uh, when we registered several attacks against security forces that started in Sao Paulo and spread to other Brazilian states, but it was quickly associated with a local criminal organization. Uh, despite the fact that uh, no terrorist action was registered in the past years or recognized as such in the past years in the country, Brazil was pushed to adopt an anti-terrorist law from different international forces and uh, it included a threat to be included in a black list regarding financial trans transactions for not having penalties for financing terrorist organization. Uh, the debate around the adoption of the anti-terrorism law uh, lasted several years, and it was finally approved in 2016, some months before the Olympic Games. Uh, the law attracted criticism from academics and social movements for its vague terms in defining which would be terrorist acts. Uh, it introduced a new series of crimes to the penal code, and it also penalizes preparatory acts of terrorism, which can lead to 30 years of imprisonment. Uh, the attempt to buy legal arms or eventually doubtful content on messages could indicate preparatory acts of terrorism. Uh, this accusation was actually used against some people, 10 people, uh, some weeks before the beginning of the Olympic, Olympic Games, you may remember that. The investigation that led to the imprisonment involved the interception of private communications, which allegedly indicated the planning of acquisition of guns uh, to perpetrate crimes in and outside of Brazil. Apparently, the accusation included several declarations extracted from Facebook and Telegram groups that would highly indicate an intention to buy guns. Uh, I believe this raises some concerns on freedom of th uh, thought and expression, including access to information, considering that certain activities and ideas may be considered an indicator of preparatory act, act of terrorism and lead to imprisonment and to 30 years of imprisonment according to the law. Examples I would mention would be participating in, 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 in 
an event or a discussion online or offline, assessing certain web pages, doing specific queries on search engines, etc. But it also raises a concern about privacy, and of course both are completely related, uh, since there is a question of how to indicate how to investigate a preparatory act of terrorism. Uh, in the approval of the Brazilian Constitution, a great emphasis was given to the protection of privacy. Um, regarding the confidentiality of communications, it determined that the secrecy of correspondence and of telegraphic data and telephone communication is inviolable, except in the later case by court order, in the cases and in the manner pre prescribed by law. While the Brazilian Constitution offers a high protection to privacy and the Telephone Inf Interception Act follows best practices uh, in regulating wiretapping, this has not prevented abuses. Uh, Brazil was, for instance, condemned in 2009 by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights for illegally intercepting communications of land rights activists in 1999. But still more concerning, I would say, is the fact that the telephone, while the telephone interception law includes several safeguards, they were not uh, incorporated by subsequent legislation involving, involving law enforcement access to metadata. Uh, some relevant examples are the laws on money laundry and criminal organizations, which oblige telecommunication companies uh, to store and give access to specific data from clients to law enforcement authorities. Marco Civil goes in the same direction when it establishes that access to internet and application logs uh, should be stored for certain periods. While anti the anti-terrorism law uh, does not include specific surveillance measures, it states that, law against that it states that the law against criminal organizations applies to terrorist organizations. So to summarize and uh, give space to our discussion, in which we can continue this conversation, uh, this newly adopted legislation, it brings several human rights concerns and it comes into an environment that can be characterized by the increasing, uh, by an increasing, increasing uh, of surveillance powers to Brazilian law enforcement agencies and a lack of safeguards when it comes to metadata and the use of new surveillance technologies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamil, and also thank you very much for highlighting that, yes, the terrorist threat exists in several countries, but in other countries they may be used as a sort of Trojan horse to vehiculate some sort of bills through the Congress, which have, are not justified by the, an actual terrorist threat, but they will achieve some other different purpose. And I think we may hear, hear something more about this from uh, Estelle Massa from Access Now. Please go ahead, Estelle. Thank you. I was asked to present specifically on the impact that certain measures adopted after a terrorist attack can have on the right to privacy and data protection. I, I would like to start by saying that a lot of the measures put forward after terrorist attacks involve data collection or profiling of um, users online and therefore the storage and further collection of data, which means that inherently there is a potential interference with these rights. In order for those interference to be justified, then they will need to be provided for by law, necessary and proportionate. So the whole point is to ensure that those measures meet those standards. I will focus on three specific measures, um, data retention, profiling in particular in the context of passenger name records agreements, and um, CV programs. First on data, on data retention, and um, I will be focusing also mostly on the EU context, but some of these comments might apply to, to the global context as well. On data retention, in particular in Europe, we had discussion on having a European-wide law on data retention around the year 2004, 2005, but the discussion were stalled until the unfortunate event in Madrid and London of terrorist attacks, and at that point, the Council uh, pushed for the quick adoption of what was the data retention directive which um, was invalidated by the EU Court of Justice in 2014 for being disproportionate. These uh, data retention measures um, require the mass collection of, the mass retention, sorry, of data of any citizen no matter whether they were under suspicion. These measures have been found disproportionate a second time recently in order to provide further guidance to member states who had kept um, national measures on data retention. A similar um, pass was followed with the negotiation at EU level of passenger name record directive, uh, which is about the um, collection by airlines of information about um, air passengers, which needs to be pushed to authorities in order to fight against serious crime and fight against terrorism. 
Um, these legislation was first on the table in 2011 in the EU Parliament and was disregarded in order to um, assess better the impact it could have on free expression and privacy. The, um, the EU Parliament was not convinced that the measures put on the table were fully proportionate and further discussion took place until 2015 when the, after the first attack, terrorist attack in Paris and in 2016 the Brussels attack, the um, negotiation on this file was no longer possible. It was only a matter of adopting it as quickly as possible without necessarily considering the, f the full impact of these measures on, on fundamental right, in particular the right to privacy. These, um, these measures uh, on PNR include um, measures on profiling um, and require and authorize authorities to check data collected at the border for PNR purposes uh, to be checked against uh, quote unquote relevant databases without specifying which type of database and um, for the purpose of the uh, said in the directive. Um, this is quite broad in the sense that um, a large number of databases exist, um, as, you, as you can imagine, and it's not clear how exactly will these data collected from the PNR, perp from the PNR um, angle will be merged with potentially other data in, into other database and which profile will be obtained by the authority accessing those data. Um, this summer, another PNR agreement in place in the EU, another PNR framework in place in the EU, the EU-Canada, uh, provisional PNR agreement was um, evaluated by the EU Court of Justice and was found to be um, not, f not in line with our human rights framework, in particular with the right to privacy and data protection, namely also for issues with regarding profiling that might happen, uh, profiling of passengers that might happen. The court also find that these measures often tend to lead also to interference with the right to non-discrimination, not always in a direct manner, but also in an indirect manner. There is some measures to try to prevent uh, discrimination and specific um, targeting of certain nationality or passengers based on uh, origin or religion. However, the risk of non-discrimination um, on an indirect basis is never fully ensured and the court has provided there though some further criteria that could be implemented in order to mitigate those those risks. And then coming to the issue of CVE program, CVE program inherently um, rely on collection of data and screening of data on platforms which may or may not involve algorithm and may or may not involve um, human, inter human intervention in determining which contents needs to be needs to be taken down, removed, or pushed uh, to the authority. Those can also have an impact on the right to privacy, which is um, not usually fully considered. And one of the main issues we see with uh, most CVE program being put forward at the moment is also the fact that um, often there is an issue with the with the legality element and the criteria to be provided for by law, either because the definition are unclear or vague or widely changing across Europe, which makes also compliance with the program difficult um, for many actors and it creates uncertainty in terms of if an actor from a certain country says something, but it's, it's shared broadly, how, how do you technically apply, uh, apply this? So there is definitely some further effort to be made in terms of, of clarity and in terms of um, compliance with uh, the provided for by law. To conclude, I, I want to highlight that uh, we all agreed on the state responsibility and duty to protect the citizen and the need to protect for the, the right to liberty and security, and this should be done in the right respecting matters. The measures that I've uh, mentioned before have not been deemed completely impossible to realize by the court, but some specific criteria has been set out. However, despite those ruling and the criteria set out, we're yet to see implementation of these measures that will allow for the full protection of the right to privacy, data protection in a way that can also help advancing security. Thank you. Thank you very much, Estelle. And also, thank you for raising a very important element and a further element of complexity, which is the frequent opacity and vagueness of the terms and the measures that are utilized to implement uh, governmental policies. And uh, I know that Edri has done tremendous work on raising awareness on this in Europe, and you're promoting a lot of campaigns and uh, releasing constantly a lot of publications and papers. So, uh, Marianne, please go ahead and explain us a little bit more about the European situation. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for all the panelists for your excellent work and, and perspectives. Um, so today I'm representing European Digital Rights, which is an association of 35 NGOs, um, and um, 
we would like to talk about today about the effects of terrorism legislation and actions on our rights. Uh, so we have serious terrorist attacks in several countries, not only in the European continent, but in other continents as well. This is a tragedy, and I would like to show my support and solidarity to all victims of terrorist attacks today. But also today I want to talk about other types of victims of terrorism. The victims of privacy and freedom of expression, thought and other uh, freedoms restrictions due to terrorism legislation and other trends that we're seeing for a while now. So what are the trends that we're seeing that affect the online environment? So you've heard about the tendency to increase surveillance powers, uh, the erosion of privacy and data protection rights under the heading of fighting against terrorism. You've also heard about data retention and uh, the passenger name records uh, legislation. Estelle mentioned, for example, in the case of data retention, that uh, the despite the concerns that NGOs like EDRI and others had uh, shown to policymakers, the Court of Justice of the Europe, they didn't decide to follow our recommendations, and yet the Court of Justice of the European Union declared it invalid because it was illegal according to EU law as Estelle explained. This case was brought by one of our members, Digital Rights Island. So we're, we see one action where an NGO had to take action to ensure that our rights are respected. Another trend is encryption that was briefly mentioned before, and probably you've heard about this in other panels. Uh, encryption is sometimes hyped as a major problem, and certain politicians have suggested simplistic and counterproductive effects uh, and policies to weaken encryption as a solution to them. While law enforcement and government aims are very legitimate, as you heard today, limiting the use of uh, cryptographic tools uh, can create vulnerabilities that can in turn be used by terrorists and criminals, the same people that we're trying uh, to protect population from. So, uh, another trend is that we see some pressure from countries to address the perceived problem of the internet and technology. For law enforcement authorities, we're seeing a trend to push for direct cooperation with companies uh, bypassing mutual legal assistance treaties, MLATs, and this is not okay in our view, uh, because there are some safeguards that uh, the MLAT procedure uh, provides that may not be respected through direct cooperation. Another trend that we see is that there are an increase of capabilities and funding for agencies so-called security-related projects, and no money, however, uh, for organizations like EDRI uh, or Access Now or any other organization in the room to actually defend uh, the rights of freedom uh, and um, in our society. So we see that this is a very concerning trend. Another trend that I would like to highlight today is that a tendency to criminalize speech and opinions more and more. This, and not only to, uh, to criminalize, uh, this is, um, a problem, but also a tendency to discriminate against minorities and their certain fractions of the population. For example, in Spain, we have seen that certain uncomfortable forms of expression have led to people being imprisoned. For example, Cesar Strawberry, who is a rapper uh, in Spain, he has made six tweets that have led the courts to actually punish him with a year imprisonment. These tweets, however, that were declared to glorify terrorism, even some of them are not related to terrorism, um, actually are now published in several newspapers. And we see that um, a previous high court in Spain had ruled that uh, this rapper was innocent. However, the Supreme Court ruled in the other way. So we see that legislation is leading to different outcomes and uh, sometimes arbitrarily decisions that are having a chilling effect on our uh, freedom of expression in this case. This is very concerning uh, because uh, of the effects not only uh, on Cesar but on all of us. And also I would like to highlight a tendency to criminalize curiosity. For example, in France, there was an offense to, crimi uh, to criminalize visiting terrorist-related websites. While the legislation had some criteria to follow, the French Constitutional Court ruled it to be unconstitutional. Again, this was thanks to the work of NGOs like La Quadrature du Net, La Ligue des Droits de l'Homme, and others. And, but yet, the legislators went on and actually a few days later had uh, this uh, criminal provision updated. And yet again, on Friday, on 15th of December, the Constitutional Court of France declared it again unconstitutional. 
So we see that there's a balance, uh, a struggle of power between um, measures that have legitimate aims ha that, however, are going beyond uh, protecting us and protecting security. So do we need to wait for NGOs, really, that struggle with funding to actually protect our rights and freedoms? I think this is a very concerning trend that, as you can see in all of the trends that I've highlighted, it seems that NGOs um, are um, like one of the key defenders of rights and freedoms. Thankfully, in the, in the area of content removals, I want to praise the, the work of Niels and their unit, because at least we're not saying that the system is perfect, but uh, as he explained, he's one of the few uh, units that are actually reviewing content on the basis of the law. We're seeing that there's more and more pressure to uh, ask companies to remove uh, content, not on the basis of the law, that we may disagree with its content, but at least it was democratically uh, elaborated. We're seeing pressure on companies to actually remove content on the basis of the terms of service that they ha themselves have uh, established. Are we comfort uh, comfortable for Twitter or any other platform uh, to actually decide what um, is good or not? And imagine that actually what they delete is uh, terrorist, like real terrorist content as some of the content that Niels uh, put forward. So what is the action that is being taken uh, place uh, from the public sector side? Are we having investigations and prosecutions? We have made um, some uh, investigations at the EU level to inquire whether there are some statistics uh, of the removals of the Europol uh, Internet Referral Unit that Niels mentioned. And the response is that there are no statistics that are being uh, kept about whether at the URLs that were declared to be removed actually are leading to prosecutions or investigations. So we don't see that there's an even a diligent approach to actually f ensure our security, which again, I stress as is very important. Um, and this, this, uh, this is really a problem that we see because we are becoming suspects by default. And this needs to stop. Counterterrorism policies uh, without a strong commitment and defense of human rights won't make us more secure. And I stress that the answer to security problems like those created by terrorism cannot be the creation of security risks or uh, fundamental rights restrictions that are not necessarily proportionate um, for the aim pursued. And how to ensure that security and freedom can work together? We think that the first step is to ensure that we have leaders that will not take emotional, reactionary, or premature actions. For instance, in the European Union level, the terrorism directive was actually drafted within two weeks uh, after the Paris terrorist attacks. There was no input assessment on whether it would undermine fundamental rights, and there was no public consultation prior to this drafting. And now, uh, the terrorism directive, for example, contains an article, Article 8, if I remember correctly, that also criminalizes the visits uh, to terrorist websites. So what, is, what are countries like France are, are going to do? We see that there will be a conflict here, and uh, we hope that uh, leaders uh, in our political sphere, but also from all stakeholders, we strongly um, come together and defend what we are here uh, for, which is the respect of DJ rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marian. I think the panelists made a tremendous work to highlight what are the key elements we have here at stake for debate. Now I would like to uh, have your thoughts, your questions. I see also there is uh, one of the authors of our book on, on platform regulations that has authored a, a chapter on uh, countering ter terrorism online that may have some comments. Christina, if you have any, go ahead. And uh, everyone else, well, Marco, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Marco from Google. I have a question for, for Neil, uh, Niels. You mentioned that the French uh, team is, uh, is running also some kind of judicial check of, of, of the request of takedown. That, that's very interesting. And, and can you tell us a little bit more about that, uh, if it's possible? <laughs> um, because that, that's, that's the best practice that was not captured before in our conversation with, um, the, with Europol. Thanks. Um, well, of course, it's not up to me to talk about the French uh, situation, but I know that there is a, a report, um, 
a, a review report. It's, it comes from the CNIL. The, I have no clue how to pronounce this in France, the, the, the full name. Data Protection, data, 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 data protection Officer. And it's, uh, it, uh, this person is related to the CNIL, and this person overviews also the, wor the, the, the content reports. But that's as far as I can go. Any other comment or questions? Don't be shy. There. Uh, hi, my name is Giovanna, and I'm with the youth here. Um, for, I'm from Brazil. So um, my question is: Yesterday we were in a panel regarding the block, uh, the block, blockage of uh, WhatsApp, and we were discussing about um, the. Because when you block uh, an app, for example, you're affecting the 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 people, the users, not only the company, and the same happened with uh, other um, uh, networks. But if you don't block it, if you doesn't block uh, the WhatsApp, the the investigation regarding a, a crime or another um, thing that happened, is this compromise? So my question is. We have to find a middle term. Um, not in that panel. We are not discussing the the uh, block uh, the block of uh, an app, but we are discussing terrorism. What we can do, like a a, 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 a really a real thing, a concrete thing that we can do that does not uh, uh, compromise the users, but does not compromise the security of the people. So that's my question for everyone. One that wants to answer it. Thank you. No, well, um, I think yes, there is. There are several challenges, but I would say, at least in Brazil, there is a lot to be done in terms of uh, adapting our surveillance of communication legislation especially when it comes to metadata. We have a uh, few safeguards in place right now. These uh, laws that I mentioned, the, the organized crime law, the money laundry law, they have incorporated several uh, possibilities of access to metadata with different levels of uh, of uh, protection, some inf some uh, some types of information can be given to authorities without a court order, uh, the so-called subscription information. Uh, we also have a, a great ta task of reviewing our Telephone Interception Act, I believe, and we also have to be uh, very careful when we talk about. Uh, that the the WhatsApp case in Brazil, the, the the lack of information in the WhatsApp case in Brazil is preventing investigations and it's preventing the combat uh, the the fight against crime. I believe we have few information about that. Most cases were secret. We have a great task in um, requiring more transparency from authorities in terms of which type of cases, uh, what are the 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 number of cases that are solved, similar to to what has been said here in the panel. In, in our case, we have little information. We have been trying to do access to information requests to authorities and have received little information on that. With the Olympic Games and the, the World Cup, several uh, surveillance technologies were acquired by, by law enforcement authorities, and we still don't know what the use that has been done of these and what are the, the safeguards and the regulation in place to regulate their use. So I believe in Brazil, at least, we have a lot to do. Uh, although there is a great cha challenge that we are all trying to figure out in several sessions here. Okay, right. Any other questions or comment? Yes, please. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> Jason Pielmeyer from the Global Network Initiative. Um, so I have a question about um, uh, cross-border data access. Um, so I guess this goes to uh, Mariette. You mentioned that Edry's position uh, is opposed to uh, MLATs generally. Um, as you know, there's, uh, maybe you can clarify. I, I heard you say you were opposed to MLATs because you don't think that the protections included are not sufficient. But uh, as you know, there's now uh, several efforts underway to, uh, to move sort of past MLATs to create 
uh, frameworks to allow governments to make requests directly to companies, which is a which is something that, at least in the case of American companies, would require an amendment to our existing uh, domestic law. Um, so maybe Stephen, you have thoughts on that as a, a representative of a U.S. company who's maybe faced some of the tensions around that. Um, and then also for Niels as a law enforcement, uh, as someone representing law enforcement, this has been cited the frustration that governments have with their ability to get access to data for criminal evidence uh, has been cited as in cases, certain cases justification for measures like data localization and or accessing and purchasing um, uh, spyware and other uh, tools to be able to get access directly through devices uh, and through software uh, vulnerabilities. Um, curious to what extent as a law enforcement official you think that is uh, indeed a legitimate issue, uh, or if you feel like in the Netherlands you have uh, enough cooperation and, and existing uh, authorities to be able to do your job uh, in terms of uh, preventing and, and prosecuting terrorism. Thank you. Yeah, so just to clarify, um, Edri, that's not opposed to AML, that's actually, my point was the other way around. So um, I think there's general agreement that MLATs have some deficiencies. Uh, like they're slow, and we agree with that. Um, but we think that instead of going directly towards direct cooperation with companies and even uh, towards government hacking as we see some trends in that direction, we see that there needs to be a prioritization of improving MLATs and not trying to bypass them. So what we are opposed is of uh, any mechanism that would actually bypass uh, MLATs uh, when trying to create cooperation between companies and, and governments? Well, <clears throat> it is true that it's, it's, it's a huge challenge to get the right information, uh, especially when it, when it has to come from, from, uh, from companies that are, well, based abroad. Uh, and the existing system with mutual legal assistance is is uh, is slow. It's and and it, and it la we lack capacity to to really really only rely upon this system to to get the information that that we need. It's true, and that's it's a huge problem also for an investi uh, online investigation in general. Yeah. Okay. Now I just want to check with our remote moderator, uh, which is Pablo. Uh, and that, that I would like to, to, to thank. And also I would like to also thank our uh, reporter, uh, Emilia, for their work that they are doing for free. Thank you very much. Uh, so Pablo, is there any question uh, from remote participants? Oh, yeah, sorry. Just to step in as one of the countries who's trying to bypass the MLAT system, um, if anyone would like to read our public reasons why um, we want to do so, uh, we've just filed an amicus brief uh, in the Supreme Court case on Microsoft um, and the Stored Communications Act, um, uh, which outlines why we don't think the MLAT, the MLAT system is sufficient in crimes of this, uh, especially in sort of crimes of this nature where you need information quickly. Um, because when the MLAT takes up to 10 months, it's a real problem. Um, and totally appreciate the safeguards that are in place. We totally understand that MLATs need reforming, but that reform is not going to come fast enough to enable us to tackle the crimes, to tackle serious crime and terrorism. And so we've tried, I mean, as you will well know, we've um, worked hard with the US government to try and put in sufficient safeguards into that proposed agreement, which include that we wouldn't be able to access data on US citizens or anyone within the US, uh, so it can only be used uh, for people outside. Um, and I guess the nature, the, the question for us is, you know, if you are a, if you are two UK citizens who are plotting a terrorist attack, which is going to take place in the UK, and the only reason we don't know about that is because uh, you're doing it over Facebook's like device messenger thing. That wasn't a good example, but you know what I mean. Um, the fact that we, even with a lawful order, are not able to get at that, uh, are not able to get at that content, except in a case of a threat to life, is really problematic. So now coming back to Pablo, do we have any uh, questions for remote participants? Hi, um, we have no remote questions so far. Okay, so uh, we have one question from the physical participant there. Hi, good morning. hello. Uh, my question is for Stephen from Twitter. Um, I'm Larry Maggot with ConnectSafely.org, and we're on Twitter's Trust and Safety Council, where we're dealing with different issues, mostly issues of cyberbullying and harassment, things like that. 
And one of the things that I learned at the last meeting, and I'm not giving anything that's confidential, is that often the decisions as to what content to take down are extremely nuanced. And we actually went through an exercise at the Trust and Safety Council meeting where a group of some of the world's leading um, experts on internet safety couldn't often get it right in terms of understanding how a Twitter moderator might respond to a particular scenario. And I was really uh, amazed at how nuanced some of these decisions are in terms of what's considered a threat, when a threat is something that's personal versus general, and when it's taken down and when it isn't. And I wonder if you could talk about some of those same issues when it comes to terrorism content or content that might be interpreted as threatening or extremely uncomfortable, but may or may not cross a line as to be something that's actionable. No, thank you for the question, Larry. That's a great question, and uh, I want to thank you already for your work on the Trust and Safety Council. I know those questions uh, very well, and it, it is very tough. It's tough for our moderators, and it's tough to um, explain how that process goes. And in, through some of those examples that you see, it, it, is, it is tough to see within the context and better understand what is directly targeted, what is, what is not. And I think when it comes to terrorism, it's even more complicated, because as we see for Twitter, the, our bread and butter and some of our, our best users are journalists and activists throughout the world. We want to ensure that we're providing them the right protection and the right tools that they can use to better disseminate their information, get information out of, out of uh, tough situations, and as well to, to make sure that there's a voice. And when it comes to terrorist content and propaganda and issues overall, it is making sure that we're finding the right balance where we're pro providing that protection for those who are reporting on very sensitive topics. Um, so they might be engaging and, and responding to or presenting content that we would we would take down otherwise if it was coming out of uh, official accounts or somebody that's a sympathizer for a certain terrorist organization. So it is something that we've been trying to address over the past uh, past year and how do we roll out a policy and how do we put in place safeguards for when something happens that we can reinstate content if we accidentally take it down and making sure there's redress mechanisms as well. Um, as these are still new new issues for us, we're, our new uh, processes overall, we're trying to better assess how those, how those are, um, impacts are taking place and where we have to fill some of the gaps where we're having the challenges. I think this is, uh, again, we're looking at more of a societal issue and, and the context of the, of the accounts overall. So addressing it both from the individual, is this an account that's retweeting or supporting um, one, account, one, one issue but has, doesn't have a history of supporting terrorism overall, or is it somebody that's more active in, in the debate? It's, uh, it is very much the context, and trying to understand those behavioral signals is uh, the big challenge for us right now. Thank you very much, Stephen. I think there is one last uh, comment or question from the gentleman over there, and then I would ask to, to well, two last questions, very brief, tweet-like questions to which we will have tweet-like replies. Thank you very much for the floor. My name is Jan Ellermann. I'm working for Europol's data protection uh, function, which involves also advising the EU Internet Referral Unit. And I have a question for Niels. But before going there, I also wanted to use the opportunity to thank the NGOs for their involvement, because I think um, the feedback we receive as law enforcement community from that angle is helpful in the end to uh, strike the right uh, balance. It was mentioned here that uh, referral units operate on basis of terms and conditions. And in our case at Europol, it's the case that we will only refer content which is within our mandate. So when I make uh, reference to the terms and conditions, what is meant here is basically that we have no enforcement powers. So we will inform the uh, content providers, but that doesn't mean that we can enforce our opinion uh, on them. Uh, so I guess, and that is my question, that this is the same in the Dutch uh, context. And uh, the other observation I had was uh, there was that slide which seemed to indicate that there is no judicial supervision or no independent review. And also here, I would just like to put this into uh, perspective. So at Europol, uh, with the EU Internet Referral Unit, we are subject to independent supervision by the European Data Protection Supervisor. Uh, on top of that, any processing operation upon personal data at Europol can certainly be brought before the European Court of Justice. So also that is something that may not be the immediate link to the referral unit as such, but I guess, again, Niels, that is my question to you. 
Uh, also in the Dutch context, I assume it is the same setting that in that sense you would be subject to judicial scrutiny as well. Thank you very much. That was a very long tweet. I will ask to, to the last uh, participant that wanted to, to uh, make a question, uh, to make a very short question, and then you can reply. Okay, uh, there, was, there was a terrorist attack in the city of Turku, and it was done from a refugee from Morocco claiming to be from Palestine. And during the time in the refugee center, this uh, refugee claimed uh, uh, bragged about giving like uh, false information to officials and asked questions how to join ISIS. This was tipped off to the police, this, uh, these actions, and police did nothing to do, the, do with this. But after this terrorist attack, police was, and many of the politicians claimed that we need more uh, information gathering so that we can find these terrorists. But this was not the problem. The problem was that uh, they, there was already a tip, but not enough resources to uh, act on this tip. So do we really need more surveillance that is actually um, harming our uh, privacy to just find these needles in a haystack? So basically, do we want to increase the amount of hay in the haystack just to find the needle? Is it really worth, worth of the time? Do, do, does the police have enough resources to act on the tips they already have right now? So I would ask now to all the panelists to choose either one or both questions and give brief reply so that you can finish on time. Please, starting, well, well uh, if you want to start from Estelle. Thank you. Um, I'm not familiar with these particular cases, but I will use it as an example to highlight that definitely increasing um, police resource and law enforcement resource and cooperation is something uh, we do highlight. We unfortunately see, unfortunately see that each time we are encounter with um, a new attack or a new security issue, the tendency is to go for new measures, uh, pushing for new measures before assessing what probably didn't work or worked in the measures that we have right now and focusing on ensuring and furthering cooperation between the law enforcement, uh, at least in the, in the EU. That's something we definitely recommended in case of a lot of cross-border um, issue with, even within the EU. We definitely saw the issue between the EU and uh, the Belgium and the French police communication. So. Um, that would be the, the message, uh, trying to focus more on cooperation before pushing for new measure and assessing how the measures that we already have are functioning or not. Thank you. Um, so just on the finished case, I mean, uh, I guess our police are thoroughly under-resourced. Police cuts are a highly controversial thing, especially in London. Um, and, um, and yes, they need more resource, but it's interesting the amount to which, you know, those dropped tips, you often just don't know their significance. And so I'd again, um, suggest more reading, I suggest endless reading today, um, but um, David Anderson, who I said wrote the review of our intelligence, uh, our investigatory powers framework, uh, did a review of the response to and the lead up to the two big, uh, three big terrorist attacks that we suffered this year, London Bridge, Westminster Bridge and Manchester. And one of the things he found was that the Manchester bombing could arguably have been prevented if there was a certain piece of intelligence that had been acted upon. So that happens all the time. And even in you know, the case where we, had, uh, where we have quite a lot of powers, quite extensive powers, uh, it still happened with us. But the, the response to that has not been, oh, but you know, let's have even more ability to do something. It was, there is human error. And at a certain point, you know, you are working with people, not just with systems. And those analysts need to be able to understand information appropriately. And, some stuff falls through the wayside, you can't eliminate all risk. Um, just on the Europol uh, and the uh, internet referral unit thing, so the UK does rely on terms of service quite a lot, we're quite open about that, um, partly because we think, uh, I think the position is generally companies should enforce them. Uh, so, you know, we do refer things because uh, individuals can refer things just as much uh, if they thought that something violated a company's terms of service. So, you know, we kind of think, well, why can't we do the same, to be honest? Um, and um, uh, but that doesn't mean, again, that we have any enforcement mechanism about that, because it's not, if it's not illegal under our law, then, well, we have limited enforcement mechanisms anyway through our internet referral unit. It can only be taken, you can only take action against a company that's actually, uh, against content that's actually hosted in the UK, uh, or a company in the UK, otherwise we can just pass it on to local law enforcement. Um, but we do look at terms of service as well, and, and, and that's a big um, part of our cooperation with the companies, who I think put up with quite a lot from us. So thank you, Twitter. <laughs> I'll soften my response then. Uh, <laughs> no, those are, those are great questions. And I think law, the law enforcement resources is a huge issue. And 
you know, working closely with law enforcement in, in Brussels and from an EU level, seeing some of the struggles and some of the challenges there um, really, really shows the kind of breadth of the issue that we're trying to deal with, particularly around a terrorist attack when things are very emotional and, and the, the eagerness to respond is, is very quick. So I think even from Twitter's standpoint, we've made some of our law enforcement guidelines quite pub uh, publicly available so they can be disseminated. So, so law enforcement agencies in a small town uh, or even outside of Turku in Finland will be able to better understand what, avail what uh, information is available on Twitter, how to make a, a proper report, what kind of uh, legal documents you will need to actually file a report with Twitter. Um, just to make it clear, as we can't be everywhere, we're a small team, so it's making sure that we can disseminate the information and make sure law enforcement agencies can um, accurately and save time in certain situations. I think overall, some of the messages is that I want to make sure that we're all understanding is that what gets measured easily gets headlines. So when we try to uh, better understand a certain situation and the impact of the work we do, um, putting the focus on different areas on how we, how we better uh, direct our attention towards countering violent extremism, I think the focus for lately has been on the, uh, the takedown and how fast we can take down things. We need to refocus our approach to on the results and the impact of those takedowns and how we are contributing to the wider narrative. And I think I mentioned this earlier on how we're trying to build out our networks around digital literacy, education, and engaging communities and NGOs across the world. And then ensuring that an open and inclusive cooperation and a societal response. I think that's key to understanding how we counter violent extremism, radicalization, promotion, and recruitment online. Thank you. Well, I won't risk answering any of the, the questions that were made. I don't know that much about the context. Uh, and despite not wanting also to be focused on the regional context or in the national context, I, I just wanted to highlight again that everything that is discussed here has a lot of impacts in our country. So the, uh, Estelle and Marian mentioned the data retention uh, mechanism that was immediately incorporated to Brazilian legislation. Several countries in Latin America are also adopting this type of, of mechanism and sometimes in our countries to fight against this type of, uh, of mechanisms, mechanisms or even demanding from our authorities uh, responses as to the extent to which these are being effective in fighting crime or these are being effective in, in, in or some transparency regarding the use of this type of mechanisms and the safeguards that would be necessary for them to be implemented, it, it may be very hard. Uh, and also to, to, to highlight the, again, the, the importance I see in more transparency and when I talk about transparency I'm talking about transparency from the private companies that are involved in these in this ecosystem and also from governments that are using these technologies and implementing these measures we haven't seen much in our countries in that in that sense and I believe it would be really necessary for us to advance in that in this uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue internationally Thanks. Um, so in response to your question, um, responding Twitter-like, I would just put a plus one uh, if Estelle tweeted her response mm -hmm. and also to uh, Jamila's response. Um, transparency actually uh, from all sides, but also from those, for example, that are trusted flaggers is very important. We, we lack information about um, uh, what, how the processes are working and whether there's actually uh, any content that is legal that has been removed. When it regards to the Europol uh, Internet Federal Unit, according to the Europol regulation, according to Article 41M, it says that the unit refers content to companies as a terms of, ser uh, as a terms of service violation that will be subject to the voluntary consideration of companies. So I agree with Eleonora that it would be obviously um, unreasonable to have law enforcement uh, powers in that sense. Uh, but at the same time, I would encourage uh, Europol and, but, and also other uh, internet referral units to actually adopt a more legal approach to actually review content uh, on the law. With regards to the supervision and oversight, uh, we see that this is very important. With, uh, with regards to the European Data Protection Supervisor um, overview over Europol, uh, the mandate of the EDPS is data protection. So for, I would have highly um, 
I would be highly skeptical whether they will be assessing any freedom of expression restriction. Um, so it would be uh, to be encouraged that actually more transparency, statistics, um, reviews uh, would be more public. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Well, um, I, th I think one of the big differences between Europol and, uh, and, and the national unit is, uh, well, everything is a bit different for Europol, of course, and, uh, and, and I think you are one of the lucky, uh, well, uh, IRUs who at least has a, an explicit legal basis for the internet referrals, uh, which is also, uh, it's explicitly mentioned in the uh, regulation. Uh, we don't have that. Uh, we do this on the basis of the general police task, uh, so that's a huge difference, and of course it's within your mandate. Terrorism is a European mandate, but what I m uh, mean is that the criteria that we use for, for referral, that these are in, in, at, nat at national level, uh, we base them on the criminal code. So that's more or less our, our fr the framework uh, for us, uh, and, well, to say so our, man our mandate would be then the, the criminal code. Uh, and one last thing about the... Um, uh, data protection um, uh, officer. That it, it's true. Um, it's there, uh, and we also have every data. I think every country has a data, data protection officer. Um, although there can be a difference in whether they only scrutinize how we use and keep and, uh, and treat data. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand the quality of our decision. Uh, why do we think that something is incitement? Or why do we think that something is a, a recruitment? And this is something that, um, well, that um, you, can, you can ask well, who, who, uh, who reviews the quality of these decisions. This is something that, that needs some, uh, some thoughts as well, I think. Okay, so thank you very much for the panelists, to the panelists for the excellent uh, inputs and thoughts. Thank you very much for the participants for the excellent comment. Now I see that I have a hammer to declare this session closed. So I officially declare the session closed. <laughs>